it's just hard enough to deal with, let's say, your personal grief or heartbreak, whether it's state violence, uh, climate change, white supremacy, white nationalist violence, violence against queer people, all of that's happening at the same time. But also we can't turn society on and off and say, I need a moment to process my personal feelings. Can white supremacy like give me a day off, please? You know, and and so it's a, a crucible. And I think the book is my attempt to kind of capture that crucible. This is a triple braided narrative set in three time periods. And I had no idea at the beginning that a story about a 19th century racehorse was going to lead me right to Jackson Pollock, but it did. And because race is such an important part of the story of the 19th century, I knew that that would have to resonate in the contemporary story as well. One of the things that was interesting to me about growing up in a family of four same-sex siblings, I have three sisters, was the way that each of us was so extremely different. And I think I had that in mind when I wrote about the Chow brothers. Each of them has experienced a different stage of their parents' Americanization. Half American is about what World War II looked like from the African American perspective. They recognized that the United States was claiming to fight this war for freedom and democracy while still having a segregated army, while still condoning this kind of Jim Crow segregation and racism all across the country. By and large, they're deeply patriotic. They want to do their part to help win the war. They want to fight for their country. And so one of the first battles they have to fight is just the opportunity to serve in the military. But the reality is that whole generation came back and really formed the, the foundation, the backbone of the civil rights movement. So Half American tries to weave all those stories together. You know, when I hear that there are younger journalists who are looking at the work that I've done, I'm honored. At the same time, I'm impressed with what so many of them are doing. The thing that helps me the most keep on keeping on is that there is a younger generation that's coming after me. Now, please welcome Lillian Curry, President and CEO of the Cleveland Foundation, to begin our borough program. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It is my honor to welcome you to the Cleveland Foundation's 88th annual Annisfield Wolf Book Award Ceremony. I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening here in person and tuning in via live stream. Today, I stand before you to introduce the profound impact and the immense power of the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards. The awards were founded in 1935 by Cleveland philanthropist Edith Annisfield Wolf. It has evolved into a prestigious platform for honoring works that address the complexities of race, racism, and the human experience. These awards have celebrated authors who dare to confront the most pressing issues of our times through the power of their words. A most remarkable aspect of the Annisfield Wolf Awards is its ability to transcend time and continue to be relevant in our ever-changing world. In a world that can feel divided, these awards remind us of the power of literature to bridge gaps and reinforce empathy as a human value. They give us the words to expand hearts and minds. They challenge us to challenge the status quo and inspire all our potentials. This is a testament to the enduring influence of these awards. This is our second year hosting in the Maltz Performing Arts Center at Case Western Reserve University, which has special ties to Edith, Annis Edith Annisfield Wolf whose family galvanized her commitment to social justice. Edith's husband, Eugene Wolfe, 
served as the president of the Temple Tefereth Israel, a congregation that originally called this building home before moving to a new temple in Beechwood. It is so meaningful to gather this evening in a space that is tied to Edith's family and her faith. I want to acknowledge the members of the jury who also steward this prize, a group of internationally renowned writers and intellectuals that include Rita Dove, Joyce Carol Oates, Dr. Steven Pinker, Sir, si Sir, Sh Sir Simon Shama, and jury chair, Dr. Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Each year, the jury selects a group of authors whose books have made important contributions to our understanding of racism and diversity. We look forward to celebrating the 88th class of the Book Award winners. As we celebrate the award winners each year, we also invite a young, talented poet from the community to read their work on stage. This evening, I'm delighted to welcome Evie Harsh, who is a sixth grade student at the Cleveland Metropolitan School District's Campus International School. And Evie will read her poem titled, Cleveland Is. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Cleveland is. Cleveland is an outlet hidden behind a bed frame, yearning to be used, but things must change for that to happen. Is a new notebook, fresh and clean. Is a song sung by Lake Erie. You can hear the Cuyahoga calling. Is a story told by the people. Is a mother, loving and kind. Is an antique shop, full and rich of history. Is a library, every story different is a hospital, a helping home to those hurting, is a life never ending, is a tree old and still growing. Thank you, Evie. What an incredible tribute to this city that we all love. Uh, Cleveland Mayor Justin Bibb is in the audience tonight. I'm sure that he enjoyed Evie's reflections on our city. We thank you, Mayor Bibb, for your championing of our youth and the arts, and for joining us tonight to celebrate the winners. Before we present tonight's awards, I want to take a moment to recognize several individuals who've helped shape and sustain the prize in recent years. This has been a year of transitions and milestones at the Cleveland Foundation and for the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards. First, I'd like to thank the Cleveland Foundation's Board of Directors for their dedication and support of these awards. I would like to invite current and former board members to please stand and be recognized. I would also like to acknowledge my predecessor, Ron Richard. Ron served as the president and CEO for the Cleveland Foundation for more than two decades before he retired this summer. Ron's passion for the book awards took the prize to new heights and laid the foundation for an even bigger future. We thank you, Ron. Next, I want to thank Karen Long, who has managed the Book Awards. She went back there. A 
amazing. I couldn't even say anything about her. <laughs> um, Karen has managed the Book Awards since 2013. She has worked day in and day out to carry out Edith Annisfeld Wolf's vision. She managed everything from jury deliberations to the selection process to the planning for this very ceremony. In addition, Karen has expanded the profile and impact of the awards in the community through Cleveland Book Week, now a series of literary and literacy programs that surround this event. She has also created the Edith Annisfield Wolf Fellowship Program, which brings these texts into classrooms to enhance the social analysis and anti-racism work. This fellowship began at Case Western Reserve University and has since expanded to Cleveland State, Ursuline College, and next year at Baldwin Wallace University. Karen has introduced... Karen has introduced Annisfield Wolf award-winning authors to audiences through new channels, including through an annual documentary in partnership with Ideastream. We opened our program this evening with a trailer for this year's documentary. I hope you will tune in when it airs on WVIZ PBS early next year. Karen will retire at the end of the year, and although this is her last ceremony as manager of the awards, she will be always part of this prize. We thank you, Karen. And we th I can't finish. Uh, for all that you've done for these awards, and now I ask you all to please stand up and give her a huge <laughs> round of applause. Last but certainly not least, I have one more recognition before we present the awards. For 27 years, Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. has overseen the award selection as the chair of the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards. Dr. Gates' profile as an intellectual giant, renowned cultural critic, has elevated this, these prizes during his tenure. This is Dr. Gates' last year as the jury chair. <laughs> And he leaves an unparalleled legacy. Dr. Gates typically hosts the award ceremony, but he could not travel to Cleveland this year for a very good reason, one that is very aligned with the spirit of these awards. This weekend, Harvard University, where Dr. Gates is the Alphonse Fletcher University professor and the director of the Hutchins Center for African American Research, will formally inaugurate Dr. Claudine Gay as the first black president of Harvard University. As Dr. Gates is participating this weekend in Cambridge, he celebrates with us in, in spirit. But he has recorded a very special message reflecting on his time as jury chair, which we will now play for you. Imagine my surprise back in the year 1989 when I opened an envelope containing a letter signed by the distinguished Princeton anthropologist Ashley Montague announcing that I was one of the winners of something called the Annisfield Wolf Book Award and was receiving a check for $500. I was thrilled and quickly did my best to find out who and what this Annisfield Wolf business was all about. I didn't learn that much about it or about its sponsoring organization, the Cleveland Foundation. After all, the internet hadn't been invented yet. But I did learn that it had a most distinguished pedigree and previous winners included Zora Neale Hurston, 1943, Langston Hughes in 54, MLK in 59, Maxine Hong Kingston, 1978, and three writers who subsequently would be awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. Wally Shoyinka, 1983, Nadine Gordimer, and Toni Morrison, both in 1988. I was in some very distinguished company. So distinguished, in fact, that I wondered if they had made a mistake. <laughs> Two years later, Ashley invited me to join the, the prize's jury, an invitation that I promptly accepted, and I asked him to invite my friend, the great poet, Rita Dove, to join the jury as well. And the three of us proceeded in this way until Ashley retired in 1995, 
and when he did, I was asked to become his successor, and things pretty much continued as they had done under Ashley for my first year. Then, in 1997, Steve Minter, who served as the CEO of the foundation between 1984 and 2003, said he wanted to talk to me about the future of the awards. And that's when everything changed. Steve invited me to come to Cleveland to discuss the future of the prizes with a former Cleveland Foundation employee named Mary Louise Hahn. And together, we totally reconstituted the Book Awards, seeking to restore the glory that they once had. And for the last 27 years, very little in my marvelously varied career has given me more joy than chairing the expanded Annsfield Wolf Book Awards jury and co-hosting first with Steve and then with my friend Ron Richard, this beautifully moving annual celebration in Cleveland where you're gathered this evening. In the years since I've had the pleasure of chairing the selection process, a little under half of my life actually, there have been 117 winners named, 38 for fiction, 38 for nonfiction, 10 for poetry, and 31 Lifetime Achievement Awards. Among this esteemed group of writers, there have been 16 Pulitzer Prize winners, 15 MacArthur geniuses, two United States Poet Laureates, and two Nobel Laureates. What I believe the Anisfield Wolf Book Award winners have in common is this. They dare to use their words to understand and work out the most challenging problems that we as a society have confronted and continue to confront. They refuse to allow power to go unchecked. They are interested in systems, even as they attend to the most minute and illustrative of details about humanity. In addition to the winners, there are many others to acknowledge tonight. First, the jurors, Rita Dove, Joyce Carol Oates, Simon Shama, and Steven Pinker, who is graciously and generously serving as host this evening so I can fulfill my obligations here at Harvard. I would be derelict if I didn't mention the people who actually make this event happen, who pour their energy into next year's Annisfield Book Awards pretty much the day after this year's event concludes. It was Steve Minter, who was the visionary, who brought me into this, and I owe him a great deal of gratitude for inviting me to be part of this community. Ron Richard, who succeeded Steve as president of the foundation, filled Steve's shoes with his graciously expansive leadership. Ron always put the needs of the community first and viewed these awards and this event as part of that service. Lillian Curry has nimbly stepped into the role of president and CEO. One of my sincere regrets about stepping down is that I won't get to work alongside Lillian nor alongside board chair Connie Hill Johnson. While as I've said, it was Steve Minter who brought me into this circle. Believe me, it was Mary Louise Hahn who taught me what that meant and ensured that I would do as I was told. <laughs> Mary Louise was the guiding light of the Book Awards for 20 years, and her grace and conviviality are still reflected in every aspect of this premier event. For the last 11 years, Karen Long has carried that mantle, and she has done so with the utmost dedication to every word, every image, and every detail of the selection process and of this ceremony. Karen has brought to bear her sophisticated familiarity with contemporary American literature and her extensive background in literary journalism to bring the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards into the digital age and to do so through brilliantly innovative and effective uses of social media and documentary film, thus vastly expanding our reach. Karen never loses sight of the individuals who are at the root of all literature, our writers the writers who give voice to so many disparate experiences, and the readers, you, the audience tonight, whose passionate love of great writing is at the heart of the literary endeavor and the basis for the success of this award ceremony. And on my staff here at Harvard, the loving attention to language, 
of Dr. Abby Wolf has been indispensable in ensuring that my tributes to each author were laudatory yet concise expressions of each author's unique blend of form and content, suggesting something about why our jury has chosen to honor their work with these prizes. My debt to Dr. Wolf is incalculable. It is attending the inauguration of Harvard's new president, my colleague Claudine Gay, that sadly prevents me from being with you this evening and bidding you farewell in person. The inauguration of President Gay marks a sea change in the history of higher education in this country. But we have not gotten to this point suddenly. Progress towards inclusiveness and a richer, less constrained definition of excellence has been measured and steady. And books, such as those that have won the Anosphere Wolf Book Awards this year and in all of the years leading up to this moment, have prepared the ground for the better world that we inhabit today. Whether works of prose, poetry, or nonfiction, the Anisfield Wolf Book Awards have consistently striven to identify what will make us better as a people. And they have forged paths of beauty, grace, and brilliance to set us on our way. It's with a heavy heart that I say farewell to this joyous responsibility that I've had these past 27 years. This is most certainly not how I would have chosen to say goodbye. But I want you to know that I'll be watching the award ceremony every year right alongside you. Just remember that I've tried to make Cleveland proud. And I'll miss you guys, especially at this time every year. Godspeed and enjoy the ceremony. We are grateful to Dr. Gates for his leadership and stewardship of this, these awards for nearly three decades. We are also grateful for the longtime Annisfield Wolf jury member, Dr. Steven Pinker, who will host the ceremony this year. Dr. Pinker is an internationally renowned ex experimental psychologist, influential intellectual, author of 12 books, among them, uh, he is elected to the National Academy of Sciences and a two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist. And he was named as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World Today. He currently serves as the John Stone Professor of Psychology at Harvard University, and he has also taught at Stanford and MIT. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Steven Pinker to the stage. Thank you, Lillian, for the kind introduction, and thank you to the Cleveland Foundation for administering these awards and hosting this splendid ceremony every year. I echo Lillian's praise for Annisfield Wolf jury chair Skip Gates and awards manager Karen Long. I've had the honor of working closely with Skip and Karen during my time on the jury, and it has been a joy. But it's not time yet for farewells. Tonight, we are here to celebrate this year's brilliant class of Annisfield Wolf Book Award winners. I'm thrilled to be in Cleveland to host this evening's ceremony. Of course, we are all here tonight because we understand the power of words to explore and shape our humanity. The words of this year's award winners do just that, and it is my honor to introduce them. Our first winner tonight is a writer whose second collection of poetry is both personal and political in its honest reflections of grief, love, violence, and survival in America. Written in Columbus, Ohio, 
uh, during the height of the COVID pandemic, Saeed Jones' Alive at the End of the World is a collection of 46 poems that range in form, tone, and tenor, evoking everything from devastation and bewilderment to joy and humor. My friend and fellow Annisfield Wolf juror, Rita Dove, calls the book an aching reminder that a queer black man leads a meta-existence. He cannot live without thinking about living, constantly negotiating the everyday with an eye to the peril that can intrude at any time, from police violence to the minutest reactions from highbrow bigots. Jones' poems are alive and unafraid in their truth-telling, employing different voices and perspectives in perpetual conversation with black cultural history and therefore American cultural history. For illuminating the apocalyptic nature of our everyday experiences, and in doing so, deepening our humanity, Saeed Jones is the recipient of the 2023 Annisfield Wolf Book Award for Poetry. I'm overwhelmed. Um, this space is so beautiful for so many reasons. Um, thank you to the Cleveland Foundation. Thank you to the many histories that have intersected to make this prize, this award possible. Thank you to the jury. Thank you to the canon that I am so honored to find myself alongside. A lesson I learned the hard way growing up um, as a gay black kid in Louisville, Texas, home of the Louisville High School Fighting Farmers. Go Farmers, this is supposed to be Pitchfork. <laughs> um, was that when you think you are alone, when you think you are the only person feeling what you're feeling, you are in one of the most vulnerable points in your life. I realize that in terms of my gender and my relationship to race, but having lived into the 37th year of this magnificent life, as I was working on the poems that became alive at the end of the world, I realized that so many of us are walking around with ghosts locked in our hearts and our heads. We are hurt. We are grieving, we are bewildered by so many betrayals and violences. And what scares me is that instead of understanding that we are a multitude, too many of us think that we are the only ones who feel this way. So I just want to say that if you can hear my voice, if you can see me, and what I've said resonates, please know you are not alone. You will never be an orphan in this world. And it is your duty to reach into your strength and connect with someone else. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to read a sad poem, but then I was like, I don't want to read a sad poem, but my book's about the apocalypse, so I'm going to read a sad poem. <laughs> I actually don't have a lot of options, <laughs> as it turns out. <laughs> I was raised heroically by my mother, Carol Sweet Jones. She raised me as a single parent. Um, and she died uh, in, in May of 2011 of a heart attack. Heart disease um, disproportionately impacts black women in this country, which is to say she died as a result of this country. And so as I was working on this book, I was already shook, but I realized that the 10th anniversary of my mother's death was May of 2021, and I found myself in a pandemic that was disproportionately impacting black women in particular. This poem is for her. Saeed, how dare you make your mother into a prelude? 
And then night neons itself inside me, and I begin missing you in loud, new ways. The sky burns itself bright, then bruises black. Things fall from the sky, and those things might be water, but could just as well be boys, or bombs, or billionaires, or birds. Honestly, between your death and me, it doesn't matter. Or I don't know, or I wasn't looking, or I can't see because I've made a home out of how much I miss you. And there's no one here to tell me I should leave. Alone and night neoned, I write, read, drink, drug, grieve, and all America keeps teaching me is that there are so many ways to die in America. Which is quite confusing because this country killed you a decade ago. And I'm still writing, reading, drinking, drugging, grieving, binging, binging, blacking out in the cozy, claustrophobic home I've made out of how very, very much I miss you. And the sky keeps throwing down consequences and corrections and histories and nations. I mean, come on. Who can blame me for not wanting to go back outside? You, a whole decade ghosted, grounded and ground down into unreliable memories, dollar word metaphors? No, not you. Mother as mortar and pestle. Mother as son mangling meaning out of his mother's misfortune. Mother as second draft, sorry. But it's awfully true. You are prelude. And your progeny, loud and unrelenting in your epilogue, somehow has to live on as your last sentence, uncompleted. Thank you. Many of us associate immigrant stories in America with coastal cities or the southern border. But Lan Samantha Chang sets the immigrant story at the center of, her, center of her novel, The Family Chow, squarely in the American heartland, in the fictional town of Haven, Wisconsin, modeled on her hometown of Appleton, Wisconsin. The novel's namesake includes Chinese immigrant and family patriarch Liao Chow, his wife Winnie, and their three American-born sons who own and operate a long-standing Chinese restaurant where the popular Americanized Chinese food belies some unsavory family drama. In conversation with Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, the plot of the family Chow revolves around the murder of Liao Chow and the subsequent trial of his oldest son, Dagu, the head chef of the restaurant, who is accused of patricide. Both mystery and comedy, The Family Chow is a story about family and class dynamics, identity and belonging. It rejects the model minority stereotype and invites us into the kitchen of a vibrant, multifaceted and maligned family in Midwestern America. For writing that both mirrors and upends traditional narratives around immigration and small town America, Lan Samantha, Samantha Chang is a recipient of the 2023 Annisfield Wolf Book Award for Fiction. Hello, it is such an extraordinary and wonderful honor for me to stand on the stage. Receiving the phone call last spring from Skip Gates, 
who told me I would be one of this year's fiction winners of an Annis Field Wolf Book Award was, in so many ways, the most meaningful event of my life as a writer. And it's also an extraordinary confluence of literary history and the reading experience of a Chinese American girl growing up in Wisconsin. <laughs> I was born in 1965 in Appleton, Wisconsin, the third of four daughters to Chinese immigrants who had come to the US as students. We were the first Chinese family to move to Appleton, and we knew of no one before us. Uh, 1965 was the year the Immigration Act was signed into law, abolishing laws that had been in place since the 1920s that virtually banned Asian immigration and our town was homogeneous, entirely Caucasian. There were no scallions, no ginger, no soy sauce in the grocery stores. We invented Chinese American fusion dishes with spaghetti noodles, um, stir frying heads of iceberg lettuce, uh, speaking a culinary language as well as a household language that had never been spoken in town before. So. In my experience, it is true that writers are born as outsiders. I wanted to be a writer since I was four years old. But until late high school, it didn't occur to me that I could publish the stories I knew. My parents, Chinese immigrants, wanted me and my sisters, my three sisters, to pursue stable professional paths. They wanted to be four for four doctor parents. <laughs> But perhaps a more substantial barrier to my dream is that in the world outside of my family, there were very few works of fiction published about or by Asian Americans at that time. It was like being invisible. Um, the children's book, The Five Chinese Brothers, by Claire Hutchett Bishop was perhaps the most well-known depiction of Chinese family life available to me as a child. The five identical slant-eyed brothers, um, each with freakish abilities, I don't know how many of you remember this book, but it's memorable to me, had a home in the Appleton Public Library and the library at Highland Elementary School. It wasn't until 1976, 77, when Maxine Hong Kingston's Woman Warrior was published. Uh, that fiction detailing the inner lives of a Chinese American immigrant family that became widely known to the general reading public. I remember encountering that book in high school, although I did not begin to write until years later. I think I then became aware of a portal, a possibility for life as a writer, opening in my mind. And so, although I didn't know it, I was supported and inspired by the Annis Field Wolf Book Awards when I was a youngster. My family has now been in the US for almost 60 years. Um, my sisters and I, although we grew up as outsiders, um, are now also deeply American. And yet, because of our Asian features, we are seen by many as newly arrived immigrants. This long-term experience can be confounding, and I set out to write The Family Chow in an effort to show the ways that three siblings can have very different and separate responses to their parents' life stories, their parents' gradual Americanization, as well as their own experiences growing up in cultures that were majority not them. Um, the novel, in conversation with Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, was into many drafts before I understood that both the Dostoevsky model and my story bore a surprising resemblance to the five Chinese brothers. <laughs> the, the Chinese brothers in the children's story defend each other in court by taking advantage of the assumption that no one from the public can tell them apart. In this way, they save their eldest brother from punishment by death and live happily ever after. Um, when The Family Chow was published, some readers felt tyrannized by Leo Chow. They felt the book painted an embarrassingly negative portrait of Chinese immigrants, and others felt it painted an embarrassingly negative portrait of small-town racism in Midwestern American society. Um, in a third response, some people asked me if I had written it only because the publishing industry had begun to pay more attention, commercial attention, to individual accounts of racism. And this was not the case, because the first pages of the novel 
Although the first pages of the novel were written in 2005, I actually began preparing to write the book as a child in Appleton. The reality of the brothers in the family child is true to my own isolated childhood reality. I would like to give my profound thanks to the Cleveland Foundation, the jury of the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards, Karen Long, and everyone here who has made this truly wonderful event possible. Um, it's a particular honor to be recognized by this distinguished jury, to know that these distinguished jury members could see, understand, and honor the complex truth of the novel as I intended it. Thank you so much. Um, thanks. I'm just going to read a bit from The Family Chow. For 35 years, everyone supported Leo Chow's restaurant, introducing choosy newcomers by showing off some real Chinese food in Haven, Wisconsin, bringing children, parents, grandparents, not wanting to dine out with the Americans, not wanting to think about which fork to use. You could say the manifold tensions of life in the new country, the focus on the future, tracking incremental gains and losses, were relieved by the fine chow. Sitting down under the dusty red lanterns, gazing at Leo's latest calendar with the limp-haired Taiwanese sylphs that Winnie hated so much, waiting for supper, everyone felt calm. In dark times, when you're feeling homesick or defeated, there is really nothing like a good steaming soup and dumplings made from scratch. Thanks very much. Our next honoree is a celebrated writer whose latest novel reckons with the history of race in America through the story of a race horse. In her novel Horse, Geraldine Brooks illuminates a largely forgotten history of 19th century America's obsession with horse racing and the skilled, often enslaved black horsemen who were instrumental in the industry. Brooks' meticulously researched and beautifully written novel traces the history of Lexington, a champion racehorse and national celebrity in the pre-Civil War America, as well as the horse's black groom, Jarrett, and an artist, Thomas J. Scott, who paints a portrait of Lexington. The provenance of that portrait connects the story from the antebellum South to mid-20th century New York City, where gallerist Martha Jackson becomes enamored with the painting and on to present-day Washington, D.C., where Theo, a Nigerian-American art historian, and Jess, a Smithsonian scientist from Australia, rescue the painting from the trash and begin their own entanglement with Lexington and Jarrett's story. For spellcasting readers into a forgotten history of sport, art, and labor in America, Geraldine Brooks is a winner of the 2023 Annisfield Book Award for Fiction. It's so wonderful to be back in Cleveland. I first came to this city in 1983, an Australian freshly graduated from Columbia Journalism School to work at the Wall Street Journal uh, at the bureau they used to have right down um, by the lakefront. I like to say it was my first foreign assignment. I got a beautiful apartment in um, Shaker Square, and when I moved in, there was a great big shovel sitting outside the front door. And I said, what's that for? And they said, you'll see. <laughs> I 
have so many feelings being here tonight. I'm thrilled and exhilarated, but mostly humbled. I'm a minnow swimming in the bright wake of magnificent literary whales. The previous winners of this prize are my heroines and heroes of writing and activism, and I feel unworthy and very blessed. Um, I, when I set out to write a novel about the greatest racehorse of the 19th century, I didn't know that I would be writing about race. But as soon as I began my research, I quickly learned that the training and care of this great horse rested on the plundered labor and skills of enslaved black horsemen. And because the book also had a contemporary storyline, I knew that the issue of race couldn't be left behind in the 19th century as if it was something that was over and done with and we didn't need to bother our pretty heads about it now. Because of course, that's not true. And I will confess that when I realized this, I wasn't sure if it was a story I should tell. You'd have to be living under a rock to be unaware of the dialogue regarding appropriation and the Twitter storms that it can engender. It's been an essential dialogue and an essential reckoning because white writers have hoarded the conch for entirely too long at the expense of black voices. So there was a moment when I considered centering the story on the white owners of the horse. I could easily have done that because these were colorful figures. They included um, an aristocratic New Yorker who'd been kicked out of West Point after he punched out his superior officer, who'd made his fortune as a riverboat gambler. Also, a doctor who was Mary Todd Lincoln's family gynecologist and a Scottish aristocrat. But I quickly realized that to center the book on these men would be unconscionable because that approach would erase the contributions of the black horsemen. And I wanted instead to acknowledge and to elevate that work. So I resolved to do the work to the best of my ability to find these men as best I could in the scant and sometimes grudgingly favorable notice they received in the turf press of the day, and in the surprisingly respectful and deferential references to them in the letters exchanged between the racehorse owners and breeders. <clears throat> in my experience, Enslavers' references to enslaved people are mostly demeaning and belittling, so it stood out and indicated how their knowledge and experience was so critical to a pursuit on which so much white wealth and prestige rested. I also found these men in the art of the day, often painted with the famous horses they trained and rode and groomed, incredibly revealing portraits of professional men who through their own resilience and tenacity had carved out an important role within a brutal system. As for my contemporary storyline, I wouldn't have been able to write that without the patience and generosity of black friends who have shared their lived experience with me throughout the years this dumb Aussie broad who arrived in this country with no real clue about the aggressions, macro and micro, that these black friends endured every day. I'm more than thankful to have been included over the years at the annual Sisters Lunch, thank you Charlene, and the Driving While Black Dinner, where I listened and gradually learned how to be a better ally. This was a book that started with my love for animals and all they give us as humans, even as we exploit them and mistreat them. It led me 
to a larger story of exploitation and mistreatment, a story that is unfinished. And ending it as artists and activists must be our work. So I hold tight to what James Baldwin said. Each of us, helplessly and forever, contains the other. Male in female, female in male, white in black, and black in white. We are part of each other. If we can hold on to that thought, if we can amplify it in our work and in our lives, maybe we can resist all the vicious and venal voices that want to deny history and purge bookshelves, promote ignorance and further lies. That's the work and what an inspiration this award is to get on with doing it. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Our nonfiction winner this year is a book that expands the canon of American history with a definitive telling of the World War II experience that centers the more than one million black patriots who risked their lives to fight fascism abroad on behalf of a country that continued to systematically oppress them at home. Matthew Delmont's Half American, the epic story of African Americans fighting World War II at home and abroad is heroically researched and rich in both historical and human detail. It tells the stories of black leaders like Thurgood Marshall, Benjamin O. Davis, Ella Baker, James Thompson, and Langston Hughes, who are on the front lines of the fight against both fascism and racism. The book also highlights the indispensable role of the black press in bringing attention to the paradox of a segregated American military fighting Nazi fascism. Half American rewrites our understanding of the greatest generation in the good war, and it highlights two key dynamics in the nature of racism. First, how a society can be compartmentalized so that it righteously fights a vicious form of external racism while being willfully oblivious to its own internal racism. And second, how an acknowledgement of this contradiction can lead to moral and historical awakenings. For this work of historic and narrative justice, Matthew Delmont is a winner of the 2023 Annisfield Wolf Book Award for Nonfiction. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank the Cleveland Foundation, the jury, and all of you. To be in the company of so many people who love books is amazing. <laughs> we should always clap for ourselves and for books. It's a good thing to do. I want to start by telling you the thing I tell my students in the classroom all the time. The stories we tell about the past matter. Today, there are fewer than 120,000 living American World War II veterans, including approximately 10,000 black veterans. I'd like to start by talking about one of them, who happens to be a Clevelander, and who happens to be here with us this evening, Robert P. Madison. Mr. Madison celebrated his 100th birthday 
just a couple of months ago. So happy belated birthday. Um, I've given probably 50 talks on this book, and I've referenced you in almost all of them. Uh, and so I can't say how much it means to me for you to come out this evening. During the war, Mr. Madison paused his architectural studies at Howard University to serve as a second lieutenant in the 92nd Infantry Division during the war, where he earned a Purple Heart in combat in Italy. After the war, he earned architectural degrees from Case Western and Harvard before returning here to his hometown of Cleveland to establish a trailblazing architectural firm. I learned about Mr. Madison's story from an oral history interview he did with the World War II Museum couple decades ago. In that interview, Mr. Madison describes going to a bookstore. And he goes to the big wall of books on World War II. You know how many books have been published in World War II, right? So you can picture it. Mr. Madison describes looking at that wall of books. There's nothing there at all about black Americans. Nothing about the airmen, the Marines, the women who served the Women's Army Corps. Nothing about the more than a million black men and women who served in the war. And the quote from that interview that stuck with me, Mr. Madison said, we were a forgotten group of people. I wrote Half American for many women like Robert Madison. The reality is you can't understand American history without understanding African American history. And you can't understand the history of World War II without understanding the experiences of the more than a million black men and women who served in the war. The reality is, and I can say this after having spent seven years working on this book, the reality is America and the Allies could not have won the war without black Americans. So I don't need to tell you how strange of a time it is to be a historian or to be someone who cares about history or cares about truth for that matter. I'm not someone who angers easily, but I get angry. I get angry at people who would like to ban the teaching of things like the history of World War II, like to ban the teaching of realities of American history. Because the reality is we need to be able to talk about both the good and the challenging aspects of our country's history. We need to be able to talk about the history of black veterans, the history of people like Mr. Robert Madison. So I want to close by reading you the last paragraph of the book and to remind you again that the stories we tell about the past matter. Stories of World War II that do not reckon with the black American experience leave us ill-prepared to understand the present and rudderless as we try to navigate the future. Ignorance is a luxury that we cannot afford. If we tell the right stories about the war, we can meet the resurgence of explicit racism as a deeply entrenched aspect of our country's political, history, and cultural life, rather than as a surprise or an anomaly. If we tell the right stories about the war, we can see modern battles over voting rights and racial justice as the continuation of decades-long struggles to make America an actual functioning democracy. And if we tell the right stories about the war, we can finally honor the sacrifices of the black veterans, defense industry workers, citizens who fought on foreign battlefields, foreign battlefields and in their own cities and towns so that no one would ever again be treated as half American. Thank you. And now, a few words about our Lifetime Achievement honoree, who is a legendary journalist and civil rights icon. Over the course of more than half a century, Charlene hunter galt has bravely brazed new trails while both chronicling and shaping world history. As a teenager, she and classmate Hamilton Holmes 
desegregated the all-white University of Georgia, where they faced violent opposition. She quickly achieved her lifelong goal of becoming a journalist, become, beginning as a student reporter, and continuing on to The New Yorker, where she became the first black journalist to write for Talk of the Town. She later reported for the NBC affiliate in Washington, D.C. and the New York Times, where she convinced the paper to open the first bureau in Harlem, as well as PBS and CNN. In 1988, she returned to her alma mater to become the first black person to deliver the commencement address at the University of Georgia. Throughout her career, Hunter Galtas pushed the field of journalism to be more inclusive in who and what is covered in the news and how it's reported. Annisfield Wolf jury chair Skip Gates says, Charlene is the living embodiment of the crossover generation who were born in Jim Crow America and lived to see the opening of the doors of educational opportunity in our coming of age. She is a giant of history, so elegantly walking in our midst. For more than six decades of pioneering and culture-defining work, Charlene Hunter Galt is the 2023 Annisfield Wolf Lifetime Achievement winner. She's old, so you have to give the chance. I know my husband's timing me, so let me get on with this. <laughs> I'd like to begin with a confession. When I turned 81 years old a few months ago, I started thinking about, why shouldn't I run for president? <laughs> hold on, hold on, my husband's timing me, so I gotta get, gotta get done, finished. I mean, I occasionally forget a word, or maybe even three. And some days I have to go a bit slower, climbing or descending stairs. But hey, isn't it time we had a woman president? <laughs> anyway, let me hasten to say that once I was informed that I would be getting the Lifetime Achievement Award, from Annisville Wolf, that did it. And yes, while I did think I would be a good POTUS, that's President of the United States. <laughs> well, there is another prospect who looks a little like me, but anyway. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> How much more of an honor could it be to be included among the amazing Annisfield Wolf lifetime achievers in the past. Some I've encountered and been inspired by over the years, including Dorothy West, whom I didn't know personally, but she came alive for me this summer in a two minute video at the amazing exhibition dedicated to her at the Martha's Vineyard Museum. I never realized how physically short she was <laughs> until I saw her writing desk 
in this exhibition, my back began to hurt trying to imagine sitting at it. Yes, I have known of or have known about many Annisville honorees, all the way from Dorothy West to Alice Walker and Sonia Sanchez, whom I got to know at the Phyllis Wheatley Poetry Festival in Jackson, Mississippi in 1973, when Margaret Walker hosted a groundbreaking armor polishing conference for black women writers for the bicentennial of Phyllis Wheatley's work, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral. And that's one of the reasons I think of myself as woke at 81. <laughs> For these days, when so many are despairing about our challenging times, I find myself being woke, quoting LL Cool J <laughs> from his album, Mama Said, Knock You Out. <laughs> Especially with the words, don't call it a new day. I've been here for years. <laughs> yes, I've been here for many years, like Zora Neale Hurston, one of Annisville's other awardees and one of my heroines. I've traveled the world in search of people, and therefore LL Cool J's words capture the way I sign my book, My People, and that is with hope. Yes, it's for the history of people like those that this organization and the Cleveland Foundation has recognized for their lifetime achievement that are among the things that keep me hopeful, for they, kept on keeping on in, with hope in their heads and with hope in their hearts. Like, well, my own mama in her own quiet way. For she too could have inspired LL Cool J because she was someone who could knock you out. I was about five years old and I had been reading the comic strip about the comic strip character Brenda Starr in one of the newspapers my grandmother purchased every day. And I told my mother I wanted to follow in Brenda Starr's footsteps. And my mother didn't say, oh no, that's what little black girls, not what little black girls can do in this separate and unequal society. My mother simply said in her very soft voice, well, that's what you want to do. The title of LL Cool J's album is Mama Said Knock You Out. And my mother just did that when she responded to what I told her. And throughout my career as a journalist, my ambition has been to write about people here and all over the world in ways that are recognizable to themselves. What I have come to realize is that much of the ignorance and therefore the division we are facing today is the result of people not being properly taught our history, history that has provided armor for our people from the day they stepped off the slave ships and for me, as I navigated racial resistance when I enrolled at the University of Georgia. Armor that helped them and me not only survive, but in time conquer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Not too long ago, I had an exchange with someone who wanted to know why was it important that we keep digging up the past. And it was a question that might have annoyed me, but for the fact that I could tell him in no uncertain terms that we keep digging up the past in order to polish our armor and share the memories, not least as motivation for a new generation as it charges, charts its path to the future and to give the lie 
to the idea a professor of mine at University of Georgia once articulated, maybe as a challenge. He said, we learn from history that we do not learn from history. <laughs> but our first black president acknowledged his debt to the past when on the campaign trail he told a crowd in Selma, Alabama, I stand on the shoulders of giants. And some of those giants are people I chronicle in my book, My People, some activists, some just good citizens who hardly ever were chronicled in their full humanity in most media. But what we experience in our everyday lives, even in these difficult times, is the need to keep alive the values, the armor that my people embraced in their schools, churches, and neighborhoods, and to protect a history that will help us all, each in our own way, face this challenging moment with history and hope in our hearts and in our heads. And I'm also hoping that my people can be done of the things that will help us create be one of the things that will help us create a coalition of the generations so that my generation, 81 years old, remember? But my generation can polish the armor of younger generations with lessons that we learned on our journey to the horizons. So with the deepest appreciation to all associated with the selection of yours truly for the Annisville Wolf Lifetime Achievement Award. And also congratulations to all who are also being honored in their categories with whom I've become best friends now. Right, you people? <laughs> Hope so, because I want your book for free. <laughs> Got that, right? Yes, I am hopeful that all of our names attached to Annisville Wolf will indeed inspire new generations to keep on keeping on so that one day Annisville Wolf can help acknowledge that we are truly free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are what? Free. If you believe it, say it. Free at last. Shout it. Free at last. Free. Free. At, at last. 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 Thank you. Good evening. I'm Karen Long, manager of the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards. Enough of that. As we gather in this space tonight, in the wake of the new UNESCO recognition of the Hopewell Mounds as World Heritage Sites, I want to acknowledge where we are, the traditional homeland of the Lenape, Shawnee, Wyandot, Miami, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and other Great Lakes tribes. Their stewardships make our lives possible, and we recognize the thousands of their descendants who live here now. I would like to thank Edith Annisfield Wolf, of course, the reason we are here tonight. She understood the need to tell the truth and to write it down in order to create the society we deserve. How far we have to go 
when students in Florida and Texas are barred from reading Toni Morrison and Zora Neale Hurston. I would like to thank Lillian Curry, who believes in handing out books, who believes in these books, and the Cleveland Foundation, which has guided these awards for more than half a century. Let me also thank Steven Pinker, our charismatic MC. <laughs> and Skip Gates and the entire jury, I am elated to say that the brilliant poet, Natasha Threadaway, will lead the next jury. In my personal pantheon, let me mention three giants. Mary Louise Hahn, who tutored me, Tara Pringle Jefferson, whose wisdom suffuses our website, and Joe Froelich, my beloved, who has heard the words Annisfield Wolf Book Awards every day for the past decade of his life, and he has not flinched. Thank you, Joe. And thanks to the many, many partners who have made this year's Book Week possible. Tomorrow, Charlene hunter will grace the stage of the City Club for a noontime forum. And later in the evening, we'll gather at Asia Plaza to celebrate the family chow with food and land Samantha Chang. On Saturday, the Great Lakes African Americans Writers Conference will kick off at 10 a.m. at the Cleveland Public Library, while Matthew Delmont will bring home to us the relevance of Half American at East Technical High School beginning at noon. Please visit our website, annisfield wolforg to learn more about these and other upcoming events. Tonight, we will conclude our celebration as the writers sign your books here at the Maltz and we trek across the street, 105th, where lighting and musicians will guide our way. The reception there is fabulous. Do not skip it. So if you would like a book signed, please join the line through the door to the right of the stage for sales and meet the authors backstage in the Buckhold Family Commons before you make your way to Park Lane. But first, I would like to invite this year's honorees to join us on stage one last time. Please come up here, Saeed Jones, whose poetry electrifies the line between the existential and the everyday. Come on, come on. And please join us. Lan Samantha Chang, who subverts stereotypes, expectations, and literary genres in her comedic masterpiece set in Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. Come forward, Geraldine Brooks, who brings Lexington to galloping life, even as she slows us down to ponder history and contemporary racism. And Matthew Delmont, whose exquisite research documents American hypocrisy and heroism in the fight for freedom. And finally, lifetime achievement winner, Charlene hunter Gold, whose trailblazing writing taught us how it's done, taught us how it's done, and shaped our history and culture. Thank you. Thank you for your love, and good night. <laughs>